This Week at Queen's Park, the Annual Auditor General's Report, Public Sector Salary Caps, Manufacturing Jobs, Northern Transportation, Hydro Rates. The Annual Auditor General's Report. On Tuesday, the Auditor General released her annual report. Both opposition parties are using the audit to question the Liberals' ability to provide oversight of government programs. The Liberals say they're working to put controls in place. That Auditor General's report last night should keep you asleep at night. The grotesque waste in our hydro system. This is about your leadership and your standards. After that kind of abuse, no wonder hydro bills are going through the roof. I just got to ask you, what's going to happen to your Mr. energy? Mr. Rural Affairs will come to kind order. Of debacle Question. Watch. How can you set that standard? Where is the bar? What's going to happen to Bob Shirelli after this incredible mess at Ontario Power Generation? <laughs> As the Leader of the Opposition knows, when we learned of the Auditor's findings, we expressed our concern to the OPG's Board Chair and CEO. We informed OPG that a plan of action had to be implemented to correct all the issues that have been identified in the report. Mr. Speaker. It's clear that Ontario's, Ontarians uh, should expect better and can expect better. The Board uh, has terminated the employment Thanks, of its Chief Financial Officer, the Executive Vice President Strategic Initiatives and Vice President uh, Internal Audit. Um, OPG will Will reduce the eligible amount performance pay of all. Thank you. Supplementary. No, I mean, very respectfully. Hold on a second here. This report you would have had in your possession four months. Uh, the, high, the energy minister has been there for ten. These jobs don't pop up like mushrooms in the dark. These are 8,000. These are jaw-dropping figures. 8,000 people making $100,000 a year more on the hydro system. 60 per cent of the workforce are in middle and upper management. It just makes no sense to those people who are struggling to pay their hydro bills to see this kind of scandalous mess. And the only time you react is when you see it as issues management. Well, once the horse is out of the barn, once the report comes out, you've got to respond to the newspapers and he makes something up. Why wasn't something done sooner? 8,000 jobs don't pop up overnight. I mean, was he asleep at the switch? This is the guy that famously Question. said, oh, don't worry about the gas plants, it's all just a cup of Tim Hortons coffee in his own Marie Antoinette moment last week. Premier, the standards you set sent a signal to investors and job creators about who is in charge. So let me ask you, who is in charge Answer. what do you do with the Hydro Minister for the incredible mess that Ontario Thank Power Generation? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, we have taken action, and I know that the Minister of Energy will want to speak to the specifics. But, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. There has not been a government, Mr. Speaker, in Ontario that has had the controls that I believe need to be in place, the controls over compensation, Mr. Speaker, in this agency. There has not been a government that has put those controls in place. Not the government, the uh, party opposite, Mr. Speaker, not the third party. We are putting those controls in place. It is very important to me that Ontarians can expect better, Mr. Speaker, and the culture that has developed over subsequent decades, Mr. Speaker. Quinty West will come to order and the, the Minister for Rural Affairs will come to order when she's answering. Please. Much, Mr. Speaker, the challenges with the ener energy sector compensation existed when the Leader of Opposition's party was in government, Mr. Speaker. He didn't change it. He was in cabinet. His leader didn't change it, Mr. Speaker. I'm not making excuses for the behaviour. What I'm saying is we are changing it. While most people were watching reacting rather with shock to those reports of sky-high salaries last March, the Premier mused about raising the reporting threshold, and there's not any evidence that she did much else, Speaker. Did she call the head of the OPG or any hydro agency to ask on behalf of ratepayers what was going on with these sky-high salaries? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The very point that I've been making is that government after government has not put the controls in place to be able to ask those questions and get that information, Mr. Speaker. And I'm not, I'm not excusing that, but I'm saying that there is a culture that developed that needs to be changed. Government after government did not make that change. I've been in this office since February, Mr. Speaker. We're going to make that change so government will be able to have direct control over those compensation packages.
Final supplementary. Speaker, may I remind the Premier that for 10 years there has been a Liberal in the Premier's office and a Liberal in the Ministry of Energy. The OPG has one shareholder, Speaker. It's the province. The Premier's job is to be a voice for the people who are paying high, sky-high electricity bills. That's part of her job. People have watched the salaries and the perks grow for years. Is she telling the people paying the bills that she didn't place a single call to find out what the heck was going on? Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General's report was over a period of 10 years. Uh, and it's important to note, Mr. Speaker, that in 2007, in response to the Agency Review Panel report, Order. the ministry reduced OPG's executive salaries by 25 to 30 percent for new executive contracts. It couldn't change existing contracts. In addition, OPG executive compensation envelope has decreased by 9 percent since 2010 and is continuing to replace exiting executives at a lower cost. Base pay for OPG executives, including vice presidents, has been frozen since 2010 and continues to be frozen. And Mr. Speaker, through their business transformation plan between uh, 2011 and 2015, yes, there will be a, a, a reduction of 2,300 full-time employees with 1,500 FTEs already happening, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. On Monday, the Liberals announced they would bring forward a plan to put caps on public sector executive compensation. The NDP want to know what the cap will be and when they can expect it to take effect. The Liberals say they need to ensure the plan addresses full compensation packages. After years of delay and discussion, the government has once again promised to take steps to rein in public sector CEO compensation. Can the Premier tell us what her CEO pay cap will be and when it may be in place? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, as I have said uh, in the House before, we intended and we are acting on, uh, on our commitment to, uh, to review and to put in place ranges which would would mean caps on uh, on executive compensation mr speaker um, the fact is that the proposal that the leader of the third party put forward did not take into account benefits mr speaker did not take into account the full benefit package the full compensation package we believe we need to do that um, that was a blunt instrument that they brought forward we need a much more sophisticated and strategic approach and that's what we're going to put in place mr speaker Thank you, supplementary Speaker, people have heard promises from this government for years, but the same old policies and tired ideas stay in place. Right. As the gas plant scandal, in fact, was heating up last September, the Liberals tried to change the channel and promised to implement a salary cap at twice the pay of the Premier. Now, instead of making it happen, they actually shut down the legislature. And last year, the CEO of Hydro One got a raise of $70,000. That pay hike alone is more than most families make in an entire year. Can the Premier tell us how many five- and six-figure pay hikes we'll see next year, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, in uh, what we have said is that we will act on our commitment, which is to uh, introduce legislation to directly control the compensation of uh, senior executives across the broader public service, Mr. Speaker, including hard caps. But in doing that, we need to establish some, fr some frameworks, Mr. Speaker, and we need to do the research that would allow us to bring in a piece of legislation that would actually deal with the issue and would not be a blunt instrument that would not take into account full compensation packages. Mr. Speaker. So that is the work that we are going to do. We will introduce the legislation in early 2014. That was our commitment, and we will follow through on it. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, in 2010, and again less than a month ago, Liberal MPPs voted against capping CEO salary. But now they claim they're ready to move forward. The record speaks for itself. In 2010, the Liberals voted against capping CEO salaries. In 2012, they promised to cap CEO salaries. In 2013, they voted against capping CEO salaries. Now, with the Auditor General scheduled to release her annual report this afternoon, the Liberals are making another desperate ploy to try and change the channel once again. <laughs> Why should people believe the Liberals this time, Speaker? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we said we were going to do this, and we are following through on that. And I believe that uh, last week, when the leader of the third party was talking about her plan, it was very difficult for her to explain what exemptions she would have in place, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And to my point about having to have legislation that's strategic and understands the sophistication of the issue and understands that we have to look at whole compensation packages, Mr. Speaker, and we have to look at a range of techni technical expertise that's needed in various sectors. That's why we need legislation that encompasses all of that and is not a blunt instrument. So, Mr. Speaker, it's true that members of our uh, government have voted against a blunt instrument legislation that would not do that, would not accomplish what uh, the leader of the third party is saying it would. So we are going to act to make sure that the legislation we introduce deals with the complexity of the concerns around those executive sure. compensation packages, the whole packages. That's the work that we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. Kellogg's announced they will shut down their London plant by the end of 2014. The PCs want to know if the Liberal government will put forward a plan to deal with the job losses in the manufacturing sector. The Liberals say they are monitoring the situation in London while continuing to support the agri-food industry across the province. Premier, we had some devastating news this morning in London, Ontario, where Kellogg's is now closing oh, down a plant. It's been there for generations. These are 500 well-paying jobs in our province. And sadly, this is the latest of a hemorrhaging of middle-class, good manufacturing jobs in our province. Premier, I've asked you every day in the legislature when you're going to bring forward a jobs plan to reverse the decline, to bring good jobs back to the province of Ontario. Leadership. It's time for leadership. My, my simple question is, with, with three days left in the session, are we going to see a jobs plan from your government? Are you out of ideas? Are we going to see more jobs leave the province of Ontario like Kellogg's? Can you bring forward a jobs sure. plan and bring jobs back to our province? You've got three days left in the session. Will you do so? Thank you. Uh, the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. Premier. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I certainly agree with the uh, premise of the first part of the, uh, uh, le the opposition leader's question, and that is that this is very bad news for the families and for the workers at Kellogg's. My, and my first concern is for the affected workers, Mr. Speaker, and the impact that this will have on their families um, and on the broader community. The Ministry of Training, Colleges and Universities is closely monitoring the situation, Mr. Speaker, and they will respond quickly to the announced layoffs. They have, as I understand it, they have not been uh, contacted at this point, but they will respond immediately, and they will work with the other levels of government, Mr. Speaker, to ensure coordinated services um, for all of those affected. Um, we'll continue to support growth and expansion, Mr. Speaker, of Ontario's agri-food business, and in the supplementaries, I will, talk about, I will talk about some of the investments that have been made and the businesses that that are uh, coming to the province. But my Thank first you. concern is for those affected workers in Ka at Kellogg's. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Supplementary. <laughs> but, Premier, the applause over there. but, Premier, you're the Minister of Agriculture. You keep seeing food processing jobs disappear. And we can still buy these products. We can still buy Kellogg's Special K, Raisin Bran, but it's no longer being made in Ontario. It's being made in the state of Michigan. We saw Heinz ketchup now will be coming out of Ohio instead of the province of Ontario. Our greatest export seems to be manufacturing jobs. I, I want to turn that around. I, and I, I don't doubt that, that you're going to reach out. You're going to try to help these families. You're going to try with retraining. And good for you as a job as premier. But a bigger goal is actually bring good jobs back to our province of Ontario to stop the hemorrhaging, to make Ontario open for investment, to give some hope, not for an unemployment check or a new course, but a hope for a good, steady, middle class job to provide for your family. Question. That's what we're fighting for. So let me ask you this. There are three days left in the session. You have no jobs plan. Will you agree to a PC call to extend the city of the legislature to give you time to bring a jobs plan to turn this province over? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, um, I want to speak about some of the specific uh, support that we've given to Kellogg's over the last few years. The and member I'm from Northumberland will come to order. The 474 member from Leeds Grenville will net come to new order. Jobs, Mr. Speaker, 474,700 net new jobs that have been created in this province since June 2009. And since February, Mr. Speaker, 59,200 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker, in Ontario. So um, I'm happy member from I Dufferin Dufferin to come to order. Member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. Which are very good, Mr. Speaker. But I want to talk specifically. 
specifically about uh, Kellogg's. Kent, Kellogg's. Middlesex, come to order. 2007, Kellogg's uh, built a 205,000 square foot. Pete's Granville, come to order, second time. In Belleville, Mr. Speaker, and that was an investment of $120 million initially. Our, the Ontario government provided financial support for that initial investment, Mr. Speaker, over $9 million, uh, a loan under the Advanced Manufacturing Investment Strategy. So, Mr. Speaker, yes, when the Leader of the Opposition talks about a jobs plan, we've been implementing a jobs plan, Mr. Speaker. Jobs are coming to Ontario. It is very unfortunate that this Thank particular you. plan is shutting down, but there are jobs. Thank you. Final supplementary. I don't doubt that the Premier feels for these people. We all do here in the Assembly. They just want a leader with a plan who's going to give them a job, not a UI check. That's all they want in the province of Ontario. Premier references a Conference Board of Canada report. What that report actually says is the Americans are recovering. They're going to demand more products. They're, they're highlighting the American recovery, and no wonder, because Kellogg's is moving from Ontario to the United States. Caterpillar has moved from Ontario to the United States. John Deere has moved from Ontario to the United States. We have Hennigis Automotive in Welland, Ontario, that has picked up and moved to the United States. They blame the high cost of electricity. They blame the tax and regulatory environment. They blame the bill after bill after bill you bring in that binds their hands and undermines our competitiveness. Yeah, you're damn right the Americans are growing. They're taking all of our jobs. I want to see the jobs in the province of Ontario. Why don't you? The seat please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, well, the premise of the Leader of the Opposition's question is just not true, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, there are companies coming to this province, and I can go through the list. Natra is setting up a confectionery food processor in London, Mr. Speaker, a manufacturing facility. Ferrero in Brantford, Royal Cannon in uh, Puslinch, Parados in Mississauga, um, Maidstone Bakery in uh, Brantford, Dr. Oetker in London, Mr. Speaker, Bolt House Farms in Wheatley. So, Mr. Speaker, there are food processors. Plants, and we're talking just about that sector. There are food processing plants that are opening and expanding in this province. The fact is that there's a very difficult situation that's taking place right now at Kellogg's, and I do not diminish that in any way. I understand that, that is a concern. But the fact also is, Mr. Speaker, that Kellogg's has located in Belleville. We have made investments in that plant in Belleville, Mr. Speaker. Kellogg has uh, invested several, several million dollars in packaging technology in, in Belleville. The plan Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, they're not relocating from London to Belleville. They're closing down. 550 people out of work. And, and you, you tried this Bobby McFerrin spin, don't, don't worry, be happy. But all of us should worry. And those that have lost their jobs are far from happy. They want to see a leader with a plan to actually get people into good jobs again, to put entrepreneurs back in business, to, to balance folks. I've laid out that plan. My team and I have laid out that plan. Nova Chemicals, another project at risk in Sarnia, Ontario, to bring a couple hundred jobs, a polyethylene plant. They're looking between the states and the province of Ontario. They're seeing energy rates go through the roof. I want those jobs here. I want to give up. I don't want to see any more Kellogg's, any more Cats. I don't want to see any more John Deere's, CCL's, Garcia in Brad. I want to see jobs staying here. We'll give you an extra week. Will you please come with a plan and stop the bleeding Thank from you. manufacturing jobs? Thank you. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Premier. Well, the reality is that Ontario is up 179% in job creation since the recession, and the U.S. is up 85%, Mr. Speaker. So the premise of the Leader of the Opposition's question is completely flawed. We are recovering more quickly than U.S. US jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker, and the fact is we are making investments in advanced manufacturing. Let's just be clear. The plan that the Leader of the Opposition is putting forward, Mr. Speaker, is one that would, would provoke a race to the bottom. When he talks about right to work, what he's talking about is undermining the organized labour in this province. The member from the P.N. Carlton will come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The, member, the Minister for Rural Affairs is warned. Thunder Bay Atacokan, come to order.
Complete, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The underpinning of what the Leader of the Opposition is talking about, Mr. Speaker, is, is uh, undermining of the gains in job yes, protection sir. that have been made over decades by organized labour. We're not going there, Mr. Speaker. The Auditor General released a special report on the Ontario Northland Transportation Commission, or ONTC. According to the report, ONTC divestments were understated in the 2012 provincial budget. The NDP want the divestments to stop, while the government says it is looking at other ways to transform the system. In 2012, the government tried to kill the ONTC without any consultation, any planning, any policy, and it claimed that it would save the taxpayers of Ontario $265 million. What it didn't tell Ontarians was that the same budget this, this government allocated $325 million for divestment costs. And yesterday, the Auditor General's report outlined this, the divestment goes ahead. It will cost the, the taxpayers of Ontario over $800 million. Will your government once and for all admit that it was wrong and announce the halt of the divestment of the ONTC? My friend and colleague across the floor knows very well that the estimate uh, of that large dollar figure is not an accurate reflection of our government's approach to transforming the ONTC. That is indeed um, an assessment of what the potential associated liability And may I say, the Auditor General says that himself, it assumes the worst. Finish, please. The, the Auditor General said this estimate assumes the worst case scenario for a severance cause estimated and that no employees would, would be retained after a divestment. Mr. Speaker, that is not our government's approach. We are very clear about how important the ONTC is in terms of an economic development uh, agency in northeastern Ontario. That's why we are committed to a transformation of the ONTC. Our Minister's Sir. Advisory Committee has recognized that the status quo will not work. Everybody, I think, understands that the status quo will not work, and that's why we're committed to supplementary. Speaker, once again to the Premier, let's talk about this government's approach to the ONTC. They announced a divestment, yet in the Auditor General's report, they didn't even bother to crunch the numbers oh. till four months after. Let's talk about this government's record on the ONTC. They're scrambling once again to come up with reason words like transformation, and you know who's left out in the cold? Northerners, seniors, the people who use the train, the customers, small business, big business. The divestment is wrong and could leave Ontario with $820 million in costs for a train that no longer stops anywhere. Is this government still planning on spending $800 million to deny essential services to Northern Ontario? Premier, is that your one Ontario? No. Minister? Mr. Speaker, we are absolutely committed to seeing a sustainable, efficient, well-run Ontario Northland Transportation Committee. Right. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, work, the people, our members of our Ministerial Advisory Committee, are in agreement with us on that. I've got some extraordinarily important quotes. How about this from Mayor Al McDonald? We all agree, including the union, the management, the stakeholders, that the business model is broken and it needs to be restructured. The focus is on transformation, not divestment. Back in May. Mr. Speaker, at the Federation of Northern Ontario Municipalities annual general meeting, I publicly stated that divestment was no longer the only option on the table, and that's why we're working so hard to see the ONTC transform. It's got a bright future, Mr. Speaker. We make the right decisions. There are some tough decisions. We'd love to have your help in that regard as well, like all other people in Northern Ontario. Answer. Last week, the government released their updated long-term energy plan. The PCs think Ontario hydro rates are driving away jobs. The government claims the province's industrial energy rates are competitive with neighboring provinces and states. How does this Liberal government expect to create jobs and the re retain the ones that we have already got in Ontario if their energy policy is the single biggest factor driving jobs Thank away? You.
Minister. Mr. Okay. Speaker, I'm sure the member didn't tell those 70 or 80 demonstrators the number of mitigation measures we have to reduce the payments on their electricity bills, and she voted against every single one of them. But, Mr. Speaker, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, industrial prices, Ontario's industrial rates compare favourably with other jurisdictions, despite what she shouts, Mr. Speaker. Industrial rates in Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada, lower than 44 American states. Industrial states in Southern Ontario are lower than in Alberta, Michigan, New Jersey, and California, and in line with states like New York, Virginia, and Tennessee. And, Ms. Mr. Speaker, they continue to state facts which are totally untrue. Mr. Speaker, they talk about Heinz, Mr. Speaker, leaving because of energy prices, and Heinz actually had the whole generation on site, Mr. Protest. Speaker. They were not paying and for the electricity bill. Mr. Speaker, they've got to come straight with the facts. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the biggest yeah. mitigation in making yeah. sure that we can control energy costs in this province is by removing that party from office. Contradict the facts we're, we're, with respect to it, industrial energy pricing. Every major corporation will tell you they're wrong. The Premier herself contradicted herself last week in Gas Plants Committee, including the, all of the bureaucrats. And this minister here couldn't even tell us last week whether the energy rates that are going up Shameful. included the cancelled gas plants. It's like a bad episode of Hogan's Heroes over there, Speaker. They know not of what they speak. I can tell you one thing, Speaker. In the next six months, Ontarians will have a choice. They can continue to choose that party who puts politics over people's energy yes. policy. Or they could choose a party, the Progressive Conservative Party under Tim Huda, who understands that the of the problem of Ontario, knows how to bring the jobs back, who actually has a plan on the floor of the Assembly. Will the minister adopt our plan, say enough is enough, and apologize to the people of this Thank country? You. <laughs> minister. Mr. Speaker, will the member tell the people, and did she tell those 50 or 60 people in front of my constituency office, that she and her party are going to proceed with a $15 billion investment in new nuclear no, that will make it the rate skyrocket, Mr. Speaker? No, she didn't. And did she tell the people in front of my constituency office that she and her party voted against these programs? No, the she didn't. Clean energy benefit. 10% discount no, off the bottom didn't. line. The Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit saves qualifying individuals up to $963 per year with a maximum of $1,097 per year for qualifying seniors. That member and her party voted against those price mitigations that reduce electricity That's bills, and she should be embarrassed for voting against what's going to help electricity rate payers, Mr. Speaker. To learn more about your provincial government, visit tvo.org slash civics101. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.